Hey everyone, we are live. Um, I am Nadia, I work at Substack on our editorial and our community. And we are here today to learn from Jarrett Carter of HBCU Digest, who's gonna talk to us about writing for a niche audience. Um, a little bit of housekeeping before we get started. There is a chat box that I'm sure most of you have discovered on the right. Um, please use it liberally to chat with each other. Um, just be nice to each other. and. Uh, also, just say hi and introduce yourself. This is kind of a fun topic because we're talking about niche topics. So I'm sure a lot of you here are writing about something strange and wild and interesting that other people would love to hear about. So um, yeah, feel free to introduce yourself and, and talk about it. Um, let's see what else. Uh, we will do a 15 minute Q&A at the end of Jarrett's presentation. Um, if you have a question, use the ask a question button, which is kind of in the middle bottom of your screen. Um, that way we'll be able to see them and uh, I will use that to inform the Q&A. Um, even if you don't have a question, uh, feel free to go through that because as you can like upvote different questions and um, it'll just like help us help us gauge a little bit of interest. Uh, let's see, okay, so um, I would like to introduce Jared Carter who writes HBCU Digest, which is a newsletter that is focused on historically black colleges and universities. Um, I asked Jared to come and talk about this topic because um, we see a lot of folks on Substack that are writing about these really specific topics, um, which is kind of like one of the best things about having a subscriber audience is you can kind of like specialize and focus on something really narrow. Um, a lot of folks that write uh, trade publications or for specific industries um, or just like any sort of strange topic that they're personally really passionate about. Um, and so we're often hearing from writers like that and uh, thought Jared would be perfect to talk about this because he's built this brand around um, focusing specifically on historically black colleges and universities, um, including his newsletter and uh, social presence and um, recently added paid subscriptions this year. So um, thought he'd be great to talk about this topic. And uh, with that, I think I will turn things over to Jarrett. Um, hey. I did myself um, here. Let me see, hopefully everybody can hear me. Um, I'm grateful to Nadia and the Substack team for giving me an opportunity to talk a, a little bit more about the HBCU Digest and the way that we've been able to build a audience uh, over the last 10 years, but specifically uh, since February here on the Substack platform, which I absolutely love. Um, just a little bit about the HBCU Digest. It is a, a newsletter slash blog uh, that focuses on historically black colleges and universities, culture, politics, and finance. Um, so that in itself is a higher education niche, right? And we focus on a specific sector of higher education. And over the last 10 years, I think what has been uh, the most helpful in building that niche audience, um, which surprisingly is not just students and alumni and faculty of HBCUs, uh, but we've developed a, a pretty sizable following of uh, state and federal legislators, obviously college presidents of these institutions and, and uh, higher education systems, and a lot of industry folks that do a lot of business with HBCUs and colleges and universities. So we've, uh, or at least I think I've been able to take an idea that was initially bred to uh, provide more information to a very specific constituent base and really diversify it because a lot of people are interested in what HBCUs are doing and what they can do and what some of the challenges are. Um, so I'm happy to see that, you know, in the comment section, everybody's checking in um, with a variety of, of niche audiences. And I'm hoping uh, that something that I may say that is, is kind of specific to higher education may resonate with you. Let me first see if I can share a screen because I know this is what everybody's here for. Uh, let's see. I am hopeful that we can do this. Can everybody see my screen? I suppose not, let's share the screen. Chrome tab, dashboard, share. There we go, hopefully everybody can see that. That's what everybody's here to see, right? So how many subscribers do I have? How many am actually paying for this? So February 19th was the first day uh, that I took all of my content, or at least a majority of it, over to Substack. And you'll see that through June 30, uh, we've made almost uh, almost fourteen thousand dollars. So, uh, for an independent journalist, um, you can't really call that a living, um, but you can say that's pretty good um, for a niche publication, right? How do we build that email list? Well, I like to say that incrementally over the last ten years, uh, from our content being shared on uh, a lot of social media platforms, and I'll take you uh, to uh, let's see another screen that I can share it with you. Uh, Let's go to Twitter. 
Uh, no, let's go to Facebook first. And now Facebook isn't isn't participating. Well, let me just say this. So on social media, we have about 80,000 followers on Facebook. We have about 60,000 on Twitter and we have about 14,000 on Instagram. So to answer your question, um, how do you build an audience? Social media is the way. You have to be an effective user of hashtags. You have to be an effective um, uh, and willing participant in group conversations. Some of them are controversial. Some of them are just running the middle of being able to give the people what they want in terms of information and coverage. Uh, if a lot of you are journalists, uh, you've grown to know over the last couple of years uh, that our business has really transitioned um, into uh, almost more entertainment than information and awareness. And so you have to you have to be able to uh, balance that that idea with the consumer where, because there are so many places from where you can get information and so many places where your audience, even if it's a niche one, can get information and cultivate it together. Uh, to be to to help shape their ideas and help shape their their awareness of certain topics, the best way to do that is participating in the conversation and and, and having personality when you inject yourselves in those conversations. So that's number one. Uh, the second thing that I think that we were able to do uh, that helped us to build our audience is to really focus on having breaking news. There's two there's two methods to it to the, the way that I do this. One, we have a pretty successful podcast. Uh, that we've been doing for for nine years and we've interviewed in excess of 50 hbcu presidents we've interviewed state lawmakers uh we've interviewed business people uh the head of head of accreditation agencies um some celebrities uh with dealings with hbcus so we've kind of really carved out uh an area where the most exclusive content that you can get on hbcus is probably going to be on the hbcu digest and once you start getting those interviews and once you start getting attention for those high profile interviews, that's when you start to get the information from industry insiders. So we're re regularly breaking news on hirings and firings of, of presidents and chancellors, uh, decisions about uh, athletics, marching bands, um, policy making at state and federal levels because we are we're, we're trusted because we, we talk to trusted voices. Uh, people tend to, to help us to cultivate and deliver content because they know that we can be a trusted site. So the trust factor is major. And part of the way that you develop that is being able to talk to and provide access to trusted voices. Um, the other thing that's big in, in talking with a niche audience is you have to, it helps if you are a part of that niche audience and you understand it. Um, I'm a graduate of a historically black college. I graduated from Morgan State University in Baltimore, Maryland in 2003. Uh, so I'm one who grew up on an HBCU campus. I've worked at an HBCU campus in administration. Um, I, obviously, I'm an alumnus. I'm a donor. So there are a lot of different areas that I experience HBCU culture, not just on my own campus, but throughout. Um, but if you don't have that 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 intimate relationship with your topic or your subject matter area, it's going to be hard for you to, to speak with a voice that people in that area can resonate with. So it's one thing you can be a higher education reporter for the better part of 40 years. But if you're going to talk about HBCUs, you have to be somebody who can identify with the voices that are reading you, because very quickly they'll be able to, to know that you're not as authentic as you could be. Uh, that covering higher education is not the same as covering historically black higher education. Um, and as I see folks on the, on the side uh, that are in publishing and entertainment, um, green energy, uh, jewelry, if you love these things and you've been a part of these cultures, your voice is going to be that much more authentic and you're naturally going to draw people to you because they're going to realize, well, there's only a, a few places I can get this information. And the person who's providing it is could be somebody who's standing behind me in a grocery store. They think just like me. They act just like me. They talk just like me, particularly when it comes to the lexicon of this topic. So the authenticity that you're able to provide in your voice is key to the, being able to to. Uh, develop an audience. The other thing is because you can't be at all places at all times, you have to have an authoritative voice on what you're covering. So I can't re I can't report or and I can't cover every single happening that that occurs within the HBCU community. There's a hundred plus colleges and universities all throughout uh, the southeastern and mid Atlantic United States. A hundred campuses that I got I got to choose stories from. 
for the things that I can't break news on, I have to be able to provide a, a more than adequate sense of what that news means. So if I ever get scooped on a story, um, let's say if a president gets fired, then what I have to follow up with is uh, an editorial or a commentary on what that hiring or firing means. So don't feel the pressure of saying that I have to be I have to be the end all and be all for all points of information on my subject matter. What you have to be is the one that knows the most about that subject matter. You have to be the one that is is willing to take a a, a strong stand on issues or willing to, to to offer really strong advice or really strong perspective on issues, even if you can't break a story. And for a lot of us, they're, they, they, we're not talking about topics where you're breaking news. You're talking about topics that people just have general interest in. Uh, but when you're a, a publication, uh, let's say like a um, TechCrunch, for example, TechCrunch doesn't take a lot of positions on Facebook privacy invasion. Um, they don't take a lot of stands on uh, you know, the Chinese government uh, using apps and software uh, to, to spy on, on, on different people inside and outside of their country. TechCrunch doesn't take stands on those things. But what they do is they will, they will give you feedback on what does that mean. So instead of taking an opinion, they will say, well, here's a list of the apps uh, that are commonly being used by China to conduct surveillance. Uh, so it, that's a way that TechCrunch can provide information can build awareness and have community surrounding points of information uh, that that really doesn't force them in a position to be political or to be divisive among their readership. So that's one thing that you have to consider. Are you willing to be divisive? Are you willing to be controversial? Because everybody's not going to agree with every single thing that you say. But what you like to do is to have the audience respect everything that you say, that even when they disagree with you, they still want to come to you for information that is valuable and information that is helpful, um, particularly in a in a in a um, direct area of interest or or influence. The other thing that I'll say is that uh, when you think about uh, the entertainment factor uh, of what we write and how we distribute information, there are two things that you want to do with a niche audience that now trusts you, that now knows that you're authentic, and now can distinguish you uh, from other writers or other publications. You have to be willing to annoy or affirm. You have to be willing to annoy or affirm. If you do one of those things every single day, you'll have an opportunity to have people to comment on your content. Um, you're going to have people uh, sharing your content. They're going to be cussing you out and praising you all in the same breath because you have struck the human interest nerve with your readers. If you are able to give them information in such a way that they become annoyed, <laughs> that they have to accept what you're saying, as a, as a good and sound fact-based opinion, or you affirm their belief in something, you affirm their, their affinity for this particular topic area, you struck gold. You don't wanna be one or the other. You don't always wanna be the one that's the cheerleader. You don't always wanna be the villain. You wanna be somebody who is regarded as, can call it down the middle, and that way you help to build audiences and communities around those two separate ideas. Either I hate what you say all the time, or I love what you say all the time, but I respect everything that you have to say. I respect it as factual, I respect it as thoughtful, and I respect it as heartfelt. Those are the keys to, to building that authenticity uh, behind what you wanna write. Now, in terms of the, the technical aspects of uh, delivering uh, what we do with our newsletter, and let me see if I can go back to, uh, once again, share my screen here. Um, let's see. Yes, everybody should be able to see that. So I'll click on um, just one example of how I do it. And let's see if this will show up for you guys. So I don't deliver my content um, one note or one article at a time. What I try to do is take a, a, a certain day in the evening and do a rundown of some key stories that have happened in the sector. So you'll see this particular edition of the newsletter has three articles in it. One news brief, two editorials. 
So that's one of the ways that that's that's one of the ways that I try to make sure that people get a wide exposure uh, to a, a broad section of news and information at one time. Because with my particular sector, you may have somebody who goes to Howard University that could care less about Paul Quinn. Or you may have somebody that goes to Morehouse College that could care less about Morgan State University in Baltimore. But by consolidating that information, I'm catching their attention to one thing or one area of focus that they may like and give them an opportunity to be exposed to another area of information that they could consider following or another school that they might consider uh, supporting or another uh, another campus that they may say, hey, that's informative. I want to know some more about that. Uh, so that's why I don't overwhelm my users with one post at a time. I don't want to fill up an email inbox. Um, and I also pace uh, my content out maybe uh, 12 to 15 stories a week, which will come out in about four to five emails weekly. And I try to do them all in the evening uh, so that people get a sense of when they can look forward to the content coming out. Uh, you don't want to have too much content coming in at one time. You don't want to have an up and down with your content where some things are so pr provocative, some things are breaking news, and then other things are not are less interesting to your audience. You want to be as consistent as possible. If you think about when we watch CNN, for example, you know what you're going to get with Don Lemon. You know what you're going to get with Chris Cuomo. If you watch Fox, you know what you're going to get with Tucker Carlson. You know what you're going to get with Hannity every single night. Even if they're talking about the same topics, you know what you're going to get in terms of personality. You know what you're going to get in terms of delivery. And that's what I try to focus on with my newsletter. Diversifying the content, but making the personality and the delivery format much of the same. Uh, and, and to that point, I think that is also a helpful area of how you grow your subscriber base, because I give people a full taste of what they'll be able to experience if they subscribe. Try to give them incentive to say to test drive it, to say, do you like it? You might want to invest in this. If you give them the opportunity to test drive it for an extended period of time, maybe they join you for free and they'll, it'll take two months for them to pay. But something will strike a nerve with that content, with that consistency that they will say, you know what, this thing is worth $50. And just for everybody who's wondering, uh, my pay scale for subscription it, uh, comes in three tiers. You can pay $5 monthly uh, for full access. You can pay $50 yearly, or you can pay $150 for a lifetime subscription. That seems to be in line with what um, my consumer base uh, is comfortable with paying and what they find to be value added for their dollar. Um, and I'm basing my, uh, my subscription strategy on the notion that I'll be able to stay at a, at a relatively healthy 10% uh, base of, of my total subscribers, um, but that hopefully I'll be able to get to 50,000 subscribers over the next few years. So if I can get to that, if I can get to that 5,000 paid subscription, uh, and, but I have 50,000 free overall based on my social media growth, then I'll be in a good place. Um, I will give you a little bit of more background about the platforms that I've used over the years because I saw a question earlier uh, in terms of uh, what separates Substack from Medium. I've used WordPress. I used uh, Medium. I've used Squarespace. And what I have found uh, is that Substack really provides the delivery mechanism, um, the editing um the editing platform that I am most comfortable using and that my readers are most comfortable consuming. Um, the average reader of the HBCU Digest is the middle-aged black woman who makes about 150 grand a year. She might be on Facebook. She probably is not on Twitter. Uh, she's not on Instagram at all, um, but she is on, she, she's checking her email daily. And she probably lives in Georgia or Florida or Houston, Texas or Washington, DC. Why is that important to know? Because if you know that your average reader fits a certain demographic, you want your content in some ways to speak to the realities of that demographic. So I would encourage everybody who they haven't done it already uh, to sign up with Google Analytics and to embed that code into your Substack website, which I, another thing I love about Substack is because they, they're intuitive about analytics and about social media integration. Um, but if you haven't done that, I encourage you to do it because you want to get a better picture of who your reader is so that you can speak to their needs and reward them 
uh, for their investment or reward them for their subscription because you're meeting things that speak to their reality and speak to their their content pursuit on a daily basis. Um, the other important thing it, it, from a content perspective and, and, a, and a tech perspective on the platform that I use, I have found that the, the email is e easy to navigate, easy to design. If there's one thing that I, I hope to see Substack develop uh, in the next few years, it's the embed uh, opportunities for Facebook. A lot of times I have found that uh, there are videos or content that I like to embed from Facebook to to supplement some of the content that I'm writing. Um, and I love it for YouTube, uh, but I love to see that a little bit more. And I love it for Twitter, but I love to see a little bit more of that for Facebook, for Instagram, um, because obviously some of the news centers around people's reaction on social media. Uh, so that would be that would be a good a good opportunity for, for Substack to integrate. Um, I also love the fact that the Substack writing community. So on Medium, you can find you can find like minded people. WordPress, it's a little more difficult. Square, Squarespace, not at all. Tumblr, not Tumblr, a little easier if you're if you're into uh, more cultural based things. But for journalists, it's easy to find uh, practicing former, uh, you know, want to be or aspiring journalists uh, to get on the platform on the Substack blog and to follow other publications and to see other writers. Uh, and their and their style, uh, their content strategy, and so I think that Substack is one of the best platforms out there, if not the best, where you can. It is the great equalizer. You don't have you know the the benefit of somebody's website looks so much better than yours, or they were able to you know purchase a, a different CMS, or they were they were able to uh, you know do something, or they have a, a larger social media following than you do. It is a great equalizer in understanding. How does this content drive people? All Substack sites, for the most part, look the same. The type is the same. Uh, the strategy on pictures and videos is the same. So you get to see what is it about their content that really moves that particular audience. And with niche or uh, with niche audiences, you get to see that the way that you're developing content provides a certain experience for that writer. I don't get a lot of comments on my site. I don't get a lot. I don't get a lot of readers who will leave a comment on the actual article. What they will do is go to social media and comments on it. So that kind of integration for me and that kind of understanding is critical to knowing how my audience takes the content, and how they share it. Um, and the final thing that I would say is that you want to give your 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 followers and give your readers uh, a true experience in that in that particular subject matter area. So if you're writing about uh, flowers and you're writing about or agriculture, you want to make sure that your language you want. And this be, this goes back to my point about uh, being fully immersed in your topic area. You want to make sure that the language you're using is language that people in that in that field use. You want to be sure that you're using terms that they can they can appreciate. Uh, you want to be sure that you're speaking with uh, a certain terminology and a certain expertise that shows. You're not just somebody who read on it, uh, but you're somebody who is 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 innately connected with this because people people will want to, to share that and they will take bits and pieces of your content and share it out. Uh, so. That in a nutshell is is is, I think, the, the strategy that I've used to build audience, um, hopefully from technical and content based perspectives. And I think that going forward, uh, my two objectives as I, or my, my long term objectives, as I mentioned, to get to 50,000 total subscribers. I don't worry about the, the social media numbers anymore. I worry more about the, the subscribers because they're the ones getting the direct content uh, in an independent, nonlinear uh, format. If I can get to 50,000, uh, I would be good. I would be good. Um, that's pretty much it. So I guess I will go to the uh, the questions. I don't know if that if you guys want me to read it, but I'm happy to do that. Uh, well, hop in and uh, thank you first off for <laughs> awesome presentation. Yeah. Um, and it's like so cool. To, I've just been sort of like following the chat too of like so many people writing about weird and interesting topics here. Uh, so <laughs> really, really fun to see everyone here. Um, I figure, yeah, we can just like dive right into questions if you if you're absolutely. Uh, Cool. Um, okay, so uh, Venkatesh asks, 
Um, what if you're targeting a niche, but your niche is geographically scattered? So that's so. a perfect that's a perfect question because mine is um, my my audience goes as far north as Delaware, uh, as far south as uh, Florida, and as far west as Oklahoma. Uh, but we have readers all over the world um, on every continent uh, and mostly every country. And so what we or what I think is is to to target that niche is to be able to speak to uh, each of the interests of that group. So I can't write about the major cities all the time. Uh, that's that's normally a, a magnet of sorts uh, to write about Houston, DC, Miami, uh, Charlotte, North Carolina, um, Atlanta. It's easy to do that. Uh, but what you have to do in some cases is to say, okay, well, what's happening in rural parts of where HBCUs are? Uh, what's happening with with uh, politics at the local level, the municipal level? It's easy to write about federal and state, but sometimes you have to write about what is the mayor talking about in Birmingham, Alabama. And I think that that doesn't that does two things. It it, it gives some of your more hyper local readers a chance to feel like they're being recognized. Even if I write about Birmingham or Mobile, Alabama, somebody in uh, you know Tupelo, Mississippi may identify with that. Because they'll say, okay, well, you know, he's writing about content in a very hyper local way. At some point, he'll get to Tupelo. <laughs> so they feel they feel married to the concept that one day I'll get to them, one day I'll be able to tell their story. Uh, but it also gives your readers from larger metropolitan areas or with broader ideas of what they want the content to be like, perspective that matters uh, in a different plane than what you would find for broad terms. So I think that what makes the digest really unique is that we can write to uh, a policy coming down from, you know, the Department of Education and saying, well, it will affect Howard University in this way, but it will affect Bowie State University in this way. And it will affect Spelman College in that way, but it may not affect uh, Jackson State University at all. Uh, so part of that is, is, is the expertise that you have in your field. Part of that is, is thinking um, as comprehensively as you can about how different changes in industrial uh, trends impact every single area of interest that your readers will have. So I think that if you do that, you tend to uh, be successful geographically. I like that. It's almost like you're you're leaning into this idea of locality instead of just trying to like erase the fact that we are all geographically scattered um, yes. and, and keeping it relevant. That's cool. Um, Sean asks, what do you charge for an individual subscription, which you did cover a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. Do you charge differently if the email address is an HBCU EU address? No. So one of the things that surprised me uh, when I moved over to Substack, this never happened in the 10 years that the Digest has been in operation. I think that the, the platform was so easy um, that schools started to call and say, well, how, how can I set my entire campus up to get the emails? And it was a, a very pleasant surprise to see that that Substack has an enterprise um, uh, uh, platform, or at least a list that you can you can plug in, and, and a lot of people can get it uh, for a subscription price. And so I'm tinkering with how do I do that with five to six thousand email addresses, <laughs> um, because I have whole campuses that want their their all of their faculty and all of their students and all of their alumni to get the digest, and they're willing to pay for it. Um, but I don't I don't know how that looks in terms of uploading an Excel spreadsheet uh, and what that may do to the analytics in terms of, um, you know, total subscribers, because some some people will uh, take one list or one email address and that's a catch all for their entire enterprise. Uh, so I'm trying to work with the schools and study uh, the Substack platform a little bit more closely uh, to figure out how that will work for me. Interesting. Yeah, I think you're, so. You're using the group subscription. It sounds like now. Right. That's what that's what the that's what a lot of my um, college presidents want. Uh, but I just want to to study and 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 think about the economic parts of that a little more closely. Cool. Yeah, and if we could ever be helpful to uh, brainstorm on that stuff, please let me know. Absolutely. Um, Jerry asks, I just joined Substack last month. I'm very new to blogging. Um, if you were to give advice to yourself before you started blogging, what advice would you give yourself? Keep it simple and don't be schizophrenic. You'd have to think about that, huh? <laughs> no. Um, one of the things I regret is that I changed platforms so many times. Um, I kept thinking that the visual appeal or the, the presentation on mobile was the most important thing. And in a lot of ways it is. Um, 
but in a lot of ways it isn't. Um, if you look at the you know, Supreme Court of the United States blog, the SCOTUS blog, very simple design, very text heavy, but it's, it's one of the more popular blogs out there or the Talking Points Memo. Um, now those are two political uh, websites, uh, but if you look at somebody like Seth Godin's blog, which has you know hundreds of thousands of subscribers, um, he writes less than 300 words a day, um, just, just bits of advice. Um, but he's conditioned his readers to want that. And so what I think that the, the most the most helpful advice I would give myself is to keep it simple, keep it minimal, find the pay more attention to the platform that you want to use. Uh, be very, very intentional about the platform that you use instead of jumping from one to another and just stick with it uh, because you save yourself a lot of heartbreak in terms of integrating your content from one to another. Uh, and, and don't be schizophrenic about what your mission is. Be very intentional about thinking about what you want your site to do, what you want your content to say to readers and stay there, stay right there because it'll work for you. It may take a year. It may take five years. It may take 10, uh, but stick with it. I've, um, you'll find that you'll be an expert. I've been on CNN. I've been on MSNBC. Um, I was recently in Forbes. I've been in the New York Times. When you when you establish an expertise, people will find you. And it doesn't, you don't have to have the best looking website. You just have to have the, the strongest, most authentic content. Uh, Jennifer asks, what did you do in the lead up to switching to mostly paid that was useful in converting free signups to paid? Um, so one of the things that I do, and this is another thing that I hope Substack will, will help the, the writers to develop. So right now, if if I want to do a campaign uh, to encourage free uh, free subscribers to sign up for the paid subscription, is I will take a bit or um, take a teaser of certain content and create a uh, basically make two posts. There's a full edition that I'll do, and then I'll make a teaser post that gives you like the first story of the three, and then say if you want to read the full digest, subscribe today. Now, what the, the thing that Substack does um, that is incredible is they allow you to send to your separate subscriber bases. You can send to just your free subscribers or you can send exclusively to your paid subscribers. And so you can track the opens, you can track the trends on both of those. And so when I, I, I may do it once a month, but once a month, maybe twice, I will do an email just to free subscribers saying, Hey, here's some content you may have missed because you haven't subscribed. Uh, or here's an ex here are some exclusives that are for paid subscribers, um, and it works well. Um, I can convert. I can reliably convert. You know, between eight and ten people uh, every time I send one of those emails out. So it actually works uh, to to make a lot of uh, exclusive for pay or for subscriber content uh, because people don't. They, you know, FOMO. They got a fear of missing out. Uh, so you want to be able to build on that, especially if they've been following you for a while. If you got somebody who's been free for you for four or five months, you got to talk to them. Some people won't subscribe until you ask them to do so. Um, so those teaser emails have really worked for me. Uh, now, I'll tell you this. Content that I don't make subscriber only are the interviews. The podcast interviews that I do, the special guest editorials that I do, I never make those for pay. What I think of those as uh, kind of marketing tools, because when a president writes an editorial or I have a president on the podcast, their school, their communities are going to share that. So that's a commercial for me. So I never make those off limits to the general public. They will always be free uh, because those will be things that people will share in great number. So if you have if you if you write a really good post or you get a really good interview or you get a breaking news story. One thing you may also consider is that you make it free for maybe 12 to 24 hours and then you lock it. So if you find that one of your posts is getting thousands and thousands of hits, you may want to let 2000 people get to it and then cut it, make it make it for pay. Uh, because if that's making the rounds, then you may say, OK, well, people are, are having interest in this. They're sharing it. So what is the way that I can 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 monetize this opportunity? I love hearing that like full range of different ways of experimenting with free versus paid content and, and mm -hmm. 
especially this phrase of like it's like a commercial for you is that we, we all say you know make your best content free because it is it serves as advertising for your, your that's, game. Right. that's right and i also just want to echo again that um this importance of just like asking people to pay because i think a lot of writers feel like nervous about asking about paying for writing um, but we've seen just time and again from a, a lot of writers, uh, including your, yourself, of if you just, you know, every once in a while, you just got to explicitly make the ask and uh, you might be pleasantly surprised to see. People. Yes. Really, really good to hear. Um, see, so Sean asks, how often are you publishing on Substack, which you covered a little bit. Uh, I, so I, I, try to, I try to do it at least at least four to five days a week, four or five editions um, with three articles per edition, at least. Um, so if you think about d days invested, it's, you know, maybe a work week. Um, if you did it in terms of articles, it's about 12 to 15. Um, but that also depends on what news is breaking and what stories are, are, um, developing. Sometimes I can do more. Sometimes I can do less. One of the things that I really want to figure out, uh, is how to be, how to how to develop a, a schedule that I can stop writing, but not have the fear of losing readership. Um, so one of the things that that uh, and, and another shout out to, to Substack. I just got the email about the the public the fellows program, yes. which I applied for. Um, that's a, that's an amazing program, um, and I think one of the big things that a niche writer will want to know is once you become successful, it's all on you, and so you you really love to figure out. Uh, how you can get a few more writers or you can invite some guest writers uh, to be a part of your publication so you don't have burnout. Um, I can tell you in the 10 years I was doing this, I was ready to quit in year three uh, because it, it was it was that much work. Uh, it was that much um, serious work and research and I was burnt out early. Um, and it's just recently, probably because of Substack, um, that I feel a little bit more comfortable not being compelled to write every day um, because I can develop a certain amount of posts per day in one edition. Um, and so when I need to, you know, when I want to say, you know, F all these schools, I can do that. <laughs> and I can come back tomorrow and say, no, 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 I love you. Take me back. <laughs> so I still maintain a schizophrenic approach, <laughs> but, but work in a healthier way. Um, so I, that, that's the way I kind of manage it. How did you push through that? year three kind of burnout feel since that it was presumably pre Substack, um, and it's something I think a lot of people relate to. Um, if I don't do it, nobody else will. That's part of, that's part of, of being a, a really niche writer um, because there's so few of us uh, serving the interests of that, of that group. You'll, you'll start to feel, and once you get an audience, you'll feel like if I don't do it, um, nobody else will. And at a certain point, the digest became successful enough that if I wouldn't, if I wouldn't or I couldn't write about certain topics, people would start emailing me and tweeting me saying, "Why haven't you written about this?" Um, I can remember uh, I had an aunt pass away, uh, and an athletic director left the school. And the morning of her funeral, I was writing an article because people were saying, "You got to write about this. You got to write about this. This is important." And I'm like, man, I can't even bury my aunt. Um, but that that comes with the work. So I, I would encourage people um, for whatever resources you can cultivate, not necessarily money, but if you can get a team of people, you know, one or two or three good writers or um, uh, to, to, to help you develop content, please do it so you don't have burnout. Um, because being a niche writer, you'll be by yourself on an island a lot and you don't want that. And one of the things, and that actually speaks to a strategy that you can use to build the popularity of your publication. If you're writing about green, uh, green energy, you may want, uh, you know, the public relations person of a green energy company or a startup to write a guest post on your on your website. That's a way that they will share it. That's a way that their audience will get your content in their hands. Um, and that's a way that other industry, um, other industry actors and, and movers and shakers will start to know your brand. Uh, so I, that's that's a way to, to get free content from other people is to ask industry folks to actually participate and lend with you know editorials or, or you know op-eds or letters to the editor, but also encourage your readers to do the same. Um, what makes Reddit so successful? Uh, what makes um, 
uh, what, what's the other site that that has a lot? Um, well, let's just say Reddit. That's all. That's all content based. That's all user based. So you you want to have your publication so people feel like they are part of a community and they're leading commenters. If you have a commenter that that is writing something on every single post that you write, invite that person to to do a post. Make them make them an acolyte. That's really great advice. Uh, another question is how uh, have you noticed any differences in how people react to different lengths of posts? Different likes. Lengths, like how long the post. Is. Oh, length. Oh, so part of part word, of the word. part of the digest style is um, even if I feel very passionate about a topic, um, I try not to go over one thousand words on a post. Even if there's a even if there is a lot of content, what I will do if there is something that needs three or 3,000 or 4,000 words, I will make it a series. So I'll be very intentional about saying, um, you know, how did, how did Bennett College lose its accreditation? Part one, part two, part three. Um, and that also builds the anticipation for your content. Um, because if, it's a, if, you're, if you're writing something that's more than a thousand words, you, you probably own some hot. Um, and so you want, to, you want to make sure that you are treating that content like a, um, like a mini series. Um, you want you want people to know that that content is like, you know, a Ross and Rachel gonna get together. <laughs> you know, that that's that that it, it doesn't just play out in one. You don't want them to be able to figure that out in 10 minutes. You want them to figure out in 10 posts. Uh, so as as often as you can can take content and break it up, uh, I think your readers are better served by it because they can they can be on a bus, uh, they can be on a conference call, not paying attention and read your content in two minutes and get a full breadth of information and expertise and come away rewarded uh, without having to invest a lot of time uh, away from the job, away from kids, away from the gym, away from a meal. They can get the sense of what you're saying in a, in a, quick, in a quick way. That's why Twitter and Facebook are so successful. So I try to do the same thing with the content. All right, uh, Jason asks, um, you mentioned a 10% uh, paid subscription rate compared to your overall reader base. How does that compare to your Patreon percentages with your podcast? Uh, do you set similar goals for that? So I don't even use Patreon anymore. Um, Patreon was, they kind of lock you into uh, certain rates for your, for your readers. And I had good participation, good subscription rates with those. I think maybe when I left Patreon, um, I think I maybe had like 330 subscribers, um, and I, I took a little bit of a of an economic hit when I switched, but that's coming back up um, because I think that people like the lower price point, they like the flexibility of it, um, and I think that the podcast because I also brought that over, it doesn't really make much of a difference in terms of the paid the paid content. I just completely switched, uh, so. You know, it's just it's just more of a flexible platform for me, um, and more of a and, and I love the fact that 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 there's an embedded podcast element to it. Um, I don't need it right now, but I'm going to use it in the future um, because I already have a a, a a podcast streaming subscription. Um, but I am going to be using that in the future. So uh, the 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 other thing I, I think that that Substack uh, should be aware of is because it kind of makes you. Um, it kind of makes you choose between what kind of a content creator you want to be. Um, with if you're if you write a lot, you don't want to just jump into podcasts because you may find that your audience really isn't podcast centric. And if you are podcast centric and your followers are, are podcast centric, they may not appreciate when you do a long form article. Um, you know, there, there's one writer I think that it has done both pretty successfully. That's probably Bill Simmons um, that does writing and does podcasting. Um, and his and his folks love all of it, um, but I think you have to build to that. Uh, so I would I would encourage people uh, that are, you know, that are that are looking in both directions to figure out what how your people react to which form, and then try to gravitate slowly over to that one. Sounds like sort of like early on, it's about finding uh, just like the product or the like style or something that you can be known for and recognized for, but. Um, as you're sort of like building your reputation, kind of being known as just a person who thinks about a certain topic, then you can start exactly. expanding. That makes sense. Yeah, pay pay attention to what your readers want. Don't don't assume because you like to podcast that that's what your readers want to hear all the time. 
Um, let's see, Jim asks, and we see cells come up in chat a little bit too, um, social media just feels so temperamental and out of one's control. Is there a way of finding your audience outside of overly relying on it? Um, and I will plug that we are doing a workshop on this topic next week, Jim. Um, email is, but you have to start out with a pretty broad audience, a pretty broad email audience that is active to do it without social media, because you don't have the benefit of hashtags and you don't have the benefit of, of trending topics that you can participate on. Um, so you have to be, you got to be pretty, you got to be pretty dope with your email list if you're not going to use social media. And I get it. Um, social media is toxic in a lot of ways. Um, and if you're an artist, like many of us are, you don't want to deal with the toxic, <laughs> you don't want to deal with the toxicity. Um, but I think it's, it's difficult, uh, to, to net organically build an audience of people whom you don't know without it. Um, so what I would do if you don't want to use social media is really get your friends and family and coworkers behind you. If you got to, well, you can't throw a party because of social distancing, but if you got to do a zoom and say, I need all of y'all to share this once a day for the next 30 days. So this can get out to your email list. Then, then I would encourage you to do it, but you got to make it work there. while. Um, you got to be a good headline writer. Uh, you got to be a, you got to be an excellent writer. You got to be really on top of of your game when it comes to grammar uh, and language. Um, and when I say language, not just being able to technically write, but to write with a lot of heart and spirit. That sounds corny, but people got to be able to fill you with what they read. Um, because other than if, if they don't, there, there's no reason to choose you over CNN or no reason to choose you over Fox. So make people enjoy the reading experience. It seems like, I mean, social media is sort of like the accelerated version of word of mouth. But if you don't do social media, then there's still the word of mouth option. Um, and exactly. we have some writers that, that do that successfully. It's just slower, maybe, or you have to have this certain bar of, of getting people so excited that they are they are uh, willing to, to share it around. Now, let me, let me say one thing um, that somebody may be thinking. I haven't seen it yet. Um, one, of the, one of the things that I notice about Substack is it's tough to get... Um, ranking on Google, on a Google search. Um, but I think that that's intentional because it's a direct, it's, it's direct delivery. Um, so there, there's not as much reliance on, can people find you with a Google search? But, 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 if you use the, the, the Substack tools for Google Analytics and Website Manager and things like that, you can bump up a little bit. And if you are somebody who is comfortable with social media, what you may lose in terms of search um, prominence, you will gain in terms of community exposure. So if you are if you are in a specific field, um, and again, uh, I'm looking through the through the sidebar to see the different kind of uh, newsletters that we're going to have. Um, but whatever the field is, pay close attention to to Facebook and Twitter and look at those hashtags. Pick the two to four hashtags that most match what your content is going to be about and then write the hell out of those, write the hell out of that content. Um, because people do find content through hashtags and they will become followers noticing that you're somebody who's always chiming in on that hashtag. Um, so I get it, social media is tough. Um, it's, a, it's a wild, wild west, uh, but it, it can work for you if you want to make this, particularly if you want to make uh, blogging and, and um, independent journalism a full-time gig. Flows asks, did you have any imposter syndrome about charging folks and how did you get over that? Um, and what informed your decision to charge what you did? Well, I never had any problem with charging folks. <laughs> I, I was nervous. I, I was nervous that people would not buy into it. But I think that um, sometimes you got to give your readers credit. Uh, people would like to get news and information for free, but they are willing to pay for it because they know that journalism is really, really um, struggling as an industry. And I think that Substack is ahead of the curve in the sense that they are, they have created a platform for reporters uh, to take their name recognition and translate that into independent media operations. So I think that in the, in the future, if you're not the New York Times or the Washington Post, or you're not Gannett or Klaschke, if you're not part of those, those large media companies, and I, I am a journalist, um, you're going to have to try to build an audience um, 
and and be, become your own media company. And so Substack as a as a platform, just as a platform and as a community, does an excellent job of encouraging that. Like here's how you you know just the fact that we're having this conversation, the fact that you guys provide the tools for people who are journalists or who want to be journalists to find out how to do this, that this is the this is the future. Um, you know, from technical and social aspects. And so I think that um, you you gotta you gotta be focused on not just how do I get my voice out there, but how do I master the science of making and building a media company? Love that. Shooting high. Mm -hmm. um, Rue asks, uh, how do you make sure your readers aren't too overwhelmed by so many emails per week? Which is a good question for you since you write basically daily, right? Yeah. Um, so I, I try to I try to jam pack um, really good, strong content in one edition per day. And I send that at night. Uh, so it's not something that that pops up while you're in the middle of trying to write your PowerPoint presentation or you're trying to you're in the middle of staff meeting um, or you're on a Zoom call and this thing pops across the screen. I try to send it at an inobtrusive time. Uh, most people are on online on Facebook between nine and 11, pretty heavy. Uh, so I try to have that that newsletter pop up at night. Uh, so people can say, oh, this is what I'll read just before I go to bed. Or it'll be the first thing I see when I get up in the morning. Um, so that way you're kind of hitting two two different kinds of readers at one time by posting at night. And then uh, you don't have to worry about sending 15 to 20 to 30 emails a week. You're only sending about maybe 15. Um, and because one of the one of the maybe five, I'm sorry, five emails, because one of the worst things that can happen to you as a writer, as a content creator, is that somebody enjoys a couple of your articles enough to subscribe. And because life happens, the next time they look at their email, you see 10 emails from Jared Carter at HBCU Digest. Because then the thing you'll be thinking is, okay, I got it. I got to get out of this. This is too much. But if you see five, then it's like, well, maybe I got to catch up on what I've been missing. Um, so rather than sending individual posts, I will put three or four posts in one email and let people be able to digest what they may have to catch up on. That's the name. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think I have time for one more question. So uh, mm -hmm. this one comes from Seth, who asks a lot of journalists in attempting to call it down the middle, which is something you were talking about earlier, um, become hated by both sides. Have you encountered yeah. this and how do you cope or be respected? Um, that's a tough one because I am hated on both sides. <laughs> um, I think the way I think the, the best way to do it, um, if you notice, like like operations like CNN and the New York Times, if you read their their stories now, they tend to they tend to cite how many sources they've talked to. So their journalism has taken a turn where it's not just being able to say what I'm telling you is the truth, but being able to substantiate how you got this information or how did I arrive at this conclusion? And so the way that you build the respect, they're not gonna, they're not gonna love you always. Um, in fact, very few of them do. But what will keep people engaged in your content is if you are the connector to more awareness. They may not like your opinion, they may not like your writing, they may not like your tone, but if you are effective with linking to other resources and you are effective at getting other people to, to talk and to write on your site with authority, what they will know is I don't like Jared, but I like that Spellman or Morehouse's president is always on the site talking about what they're doing. And so they can hate me, but they will know that the, the only play that I, the only place that I can get this kind of information is through him. And so I'll keep subscribing and I'll keep funding it because I appreciate the fact that while I can't stand him, he does come with good information. And that's what you ultimately want. You want to entertain, but above all else, you want to, to create good information and build good awareness. I like the the willingness to also just sort of be hated and do the thing that you believe. I don't, in. you know, I don't try to be hated. Some people, <laughs> you know, some people try to be hated and they they try to troll people. I just, I, you know, I just 
particularly with the sector that I cover, there's there are a lot of challenges. Higher education is in a bad place right now, um, and particularly for historically black institutions. And some of that stuff, some of the truth about it is very uncomfortable to read. It means a lot to us who graduated from these schools. Um, so I, I try to be honest about it um, and not antagonistic, but by nature, some of that information is going to rub people the wrong way. And so what I, again, what I try to do is say, you know, it's like the old reading rainbow. Don't take my word for it, you know, read this. If you don't believe me, then read that. And I think that's what keeps people engaged. Awesome. Uh, I think we're out of time. Thank you so much for this really informative presentation, sharing your experience, um, answering questions is all really, really helpful. Um, sounds like a lot of folks really got a lot out of it. So thank you. I hope so. Thank um, you all. I'm just so gonna, I was just going to share the um, fellowship program also, since you mentioned it earlier, uh, that we just announced this yesterday. If you're interested in applying to be a Substack fellow, um, check that out. Applications are open this week. Uh, so yes. Check that out. Um, and very, yeah, we are very easy to apply. I encourage everybody to do it. It's very good. easy to take it. along. Please, please apply. It's a good program. Glad to hear it. Um, and we are running another workshop next week if anyone's interested. And in, uh, it's about building your audience when you don't have one. So very relevant to the social media question. Um, keep an eye on the blog for that. Uh, thanks again, Jarrett. Thank you so much. Bye.